Welcome to Slate Church. We are so glad that you're tuning in today and pray that wherever you are, this message will bless you. If this impacts you in any way, we would love to hear about it. Send an email to mystory@slatechurch.com. today. It's an honor to to be with you here today at the 10 a.m. service at Slate Church, the most wonderful, the holiest, the best looking service of all the services at Slate Church. It's an awesome, awesome morning to be here. If you don't know who I am, my name is Beth Moore, and I'm a little bit biased because I am one of the site pastors for our 10 a.m. morning service in Waterloo at Slate Church, and I have the privilege of doing that alongside my incredibly wonderful and super hot husband Jared Moore who's fantastic and I'm a little bit biased but I think any service that he is in is the best looking service at Slate Church and Jared and I have of course have the privilege of being able to serve under the leadership of our four lead pastors we do have two sets of of married couples leading us at Slate Church so we are doubly blessed pastors Brandon and Emma Richardson and Luke and Victoria Betger and they're all just phenomenal people men and women of God and a couple of weeks ago we had our vision Sunday at Slate Church and it was an opportunity for us to gather together as a church and hear about some of the things that God is putting on the hearts for for our lead pastors for this next year of 2020 at Slate Church. And I remember just sitting in that service and, and hearing some of the stories that people were sharing about the life change that they've experienced since Slate Church launched and the incredible initiatives that are gonna be coming out of this church this year. And as I was hearing all these things, I was just so thankful and, and honored to be able to lead under lead pastors that are always coming to God and saying, what's next? They're, they're not ever becoming complacent. They're never really becoming comfortable. And they're very thankful for everything that God has done in our community up to this point. But they know that God's not done yet. They know that God still has more for this church, more for this community. And it's that same spirit of saying, God, what's next? That led to the launch of Slate Church in 2017. That led to the launch of this morning service that we're all sitting in right now. Led to the launch of Slate Church Elmira. It's also meaning that it's going to lead to this, this this launch and the announcement that we had of another location of Slate Church in 2020. It's a phenomenal, incredible thing. And you know, when we take time to honor our lead pastors and to thank them for what they have done up to this point, it's not because they so desperately need it to actually be able to keep leading at Slate Church, and it's not because they're paying us to do it as your site pastors, but it's because it's for our entire church when we take these moments. And just really quickly, in 1 Thessalonians, the message translation in 5.12 says, Honor those leaders who work so hard for you, who have been given the responsibility of urging and guiding you along in your obedience. Overwhelm them with appreciation and love. And showing this appreciation and love helps us to maintain a spirit of thankfulness. It actually contributes to our unity and our longevity as a church. And it contributes to our ability to continue on forward in a spirit of thankfulness, which can unleash the blessings that God has for this community into the future. And so this morning, why don't we just take a moment here, honor our lead pastors, thank them for everything they've done. We love you guys. It's incredible. Well, we are feeling the love today, and I think it's a fitting place to be as we step into the second week of this series of bold relationships at Slate Church. We are deep into the month of February now, and I'm going to say it now because this is actually your last Sunday and your last reminder that you're going to get from me that Valentine's Day is now five days away, okay? So you've got you to do what you need to do, order the flowers, get that reservation, buy the card, do whatever you need to do to make this a, a bold Valentine's Day for you. It's going to be fantastic. And if you, you did miss our Vision Sunday, we, we talked about our focus and our theme for this next year of bold. We want to maintain a spirit of, of boldness at Slate Church. And we want to be bold in our faith. We want to be bold in our, our witness, our generosity, our discipleship. But another thing that we want to be bold in as a church is our relationships. And we want to take this time to start off a new year and actually lay a foundation for this. And this doesn't just apply to our marriages or, or things 
things like that in such a, a romantic context, but it also applies to our community. It applies to the relationships that we have with one another, to our friendships, to our, our relationships with neighbors and coworkers. And so my hope today is that through the word that God has given to me, he would actually speak something to you that would be sealed in your heart and it would enable you and empower you to love boldly in 2020, whatever that looks like in whatever relationships that may be. Does that sound okay? Awesome. Well, let's jump right into it. If you've got a Bible with you, why don't you turn with me to James 3 verse 18. I'm going to be reading from the message translation this morning, so don't worry if it looks a little bit different than when you've, what you've got. It will also be up on the screen behind me, so you can feel free to follow along there. James 3, verse 18, it says this. You can develop a healthy, robust community that lives right with God and enjoy its results only if you do the hard work. Everybody say hard work. Only if you do the hard work of getting along with each other, treating each other with dignity and honor. Can we read that one more time? I love this verse. You can develop a healthy, robust community that lives right with God and enjoy its results only if you do the hard work of getting along with each other, treating each other with dignity and honor. For the note takers today, you can title this message, Some Assembly Required. Let's pray this morning. God, we thank you so much for your church. We thank you for the fact that we have an opportunity to get together every single week and to learn what it looks like to follow you, Lord. And God, I thank you that we don't have to wait even in this moment for your presence to, to be with us, but that you're already here, that you were here in our time as, as community in the lobby this morning. You met us here in our worship. And God, you continue to go with us throughout this message as well. And so, Lord, this morning, I pray that these words would be yours, that you would speak to us today, and that none of us would leave this place the same as we were when we came in this morning. We pray this all in your mighty name. And everybody said, amen. amen, amen. Well, as I was preparing for this message, I spent some time thinking about what bold relationships look like, what it actually takes to be in a relationship that, that looks bold, that has a sense of longevity and a sense of strength to it. And I was thinking there's got to be some sort of litmus test or, or something like that that helps you measure the strength of a relationship long term. And I was thinking about this, and as I was, I was preparing, I realized I, I think I finally figured out what that thing actually is. I think I've, I've begun to to understand what this litmus test is that helps us to understand the strength of our relationships. And it's called building IKEA furniture. <laughs> has there, is there anyone in this place that has gone through the trial of building IKEA furniture with your spouse? Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting experience for sure. A couple of weeks ago, Jared and I, we went on a trip to Ikea. We had the day off together, and so we thought, you know, let's, let's get in the car. Let's drive down to Burlington. We'll be able to grab some food when we get in there, fill up a little bit, be able to just kind of meander around the store, relax, have a good time as you do at Ikea. And so we had this great expectation of what this was going to look like. And as we pulled into Ikea, I don't know what happened, but this is not the narrative that unfolded this day. We got out of the car and we got into Ikea and we're starting to look for the one thing that we had gone to Ikea for, just one thing. And we were going through the showroom and the warehouse and then going back through the showroom and the warehouse and trying to find this thing in the store and we're not finding it anywhere. And so we go and we speak to a salesperson that really just gives us like a, a list of, of where we need to go in the store. And so now we're using maps to try and navigate this store and we're starting to get like hungrier and hungrier. And you know how that's just not good for relationships, especially when you're trying to figure something out. And so we're walking around this Ikea and we're at the point now where we're just like starving. And you can feel the tension that's beginning to grow between both of us in this store. And so, Honestly, I don't know what happened, but we're starting to just like put things into the cart that we like don't need or we didn't talk about. And it's actually like an incredible thing. We somehow redid our living room without like having any conversation about it in this Ikea. We're just like throwing things in and not talking about it at all. And 
we get all these things and they're in the cart and I realize like we still haven't eaten anything so now we're both just like starving and hungry and Jared's out and he's loading all of these things that we somehow ended up with into the car and so I go back into Ikea and I'm like I just need every hot dog you have right now just give me the hot dogs and so I'm like balancing all these hot dogs with ketchup on them into the parking lot and because we did not plan on on purchasing the things that we had actually picked up in the store he had pushed the the front passenger seat so close up to the dash that I'm like pressed against the windshield with all these hot dogs in my arms and I remember looking back at the car and thinking like this is not supposed to be the hard part like we're supposed to enjoy this part this is the relaxing part of Ikea but we've got all of these things now to take home with us and it's going to be an interesting experience and so we go home and we unload all of this stuff and on one side of the room it's like shelving units and table legs and all of the things that are going to become furniture and on the other side of the room is just like thousands of tiny screws that just are going to be everywhere and those useless little allen keys you know that they give you to build it all and I'm looking at this scene and it actually triggered a memory for me of, of seeing that exact same scene a couple of, of years ago and the last time that we were in this environment. And I remembered it so clearly because there was another two people that were in the room with us that day when we were setting up the Ikea furniture. And that day, Jared and I had just come back from our honeymoon and we thought, you know, there's a lot of stuff to set up here. Like, why don't we actually call some people to come in and be a part of it? And so, we get on the phone with a couple of our friends. Jared calls one of his, I call one of mine, and we say to them, hey, what are you doing tonight? Do you want to just like maybe come over? We could watch a movie, eat some snacks, really just have a relaxing Friday evening. And both of our friends are like, yeah, that sounds amazing. I'm in. And so a couple minutes later, the very unsuspecting Julia Hutchison and Blake Rice, both of, of who go to our, our church community, walked in and just see this Ikea furniture everywhere. And they're like, what have we gotten ourselves into? But they stayed. They actually stayed and they helped us get all of these things set up and what was just pieces of, of furniture and, and um, screws and things around the room actually turned into what would become our condo. And we had this beautiful setup that was there because of their help and as I was thinking about all of this, I thought that was such a cool picture because in that moment, they were helping us to assemble our furniture. But Julia and Blake that night weren't just assembling our furniture. They were actually assembling and building into some relationships as well. They knew when they walked in there that that was not the Friday night that they had planned, but they were actually making a deposit and building into friendships that they knew and would hoped and hoped would continue on into the future as well. And the reality in all of this is that to have great relationships in our life and to have anything great for that matter, sometimes it takes a little bit of work. And for Julia and Blake that night, it meant sacrificing their individual Friday nights and coming to be a part of something else. And by the grace of God, we're still friends in spite of that. But they knew that it was going to take a little bit of work, some assembly, Cultivating these bold, life-giving relationships doesn't just happen. And we know as Christians that we aren't meant to do life alone. And living in community was actually God's design for us as people. In Genesis 2 verse 18, God says that it is not good for man to be alone. And this is interesting because it's actually the first time in the creation story that God looks at something and he says that it's not good. We see previous to this moment that he creates the, star, the stars and the sky and the ocean and all the animals and he looks at all of these things and he calls them good. But he looks at Adam being on his own and it's not good. And that's something that's important for us to pay attention to. And so God creates Eve to be in relationship with Adam and he instructs them to be fruitful and to multiply and to go into the earth and subdue it. And so from this point begins this beautiful narrative of, of humanity and people living in relationship with one another and the world. But if we fast forward all of these years later and look at us now in 2020 and where we're at with our relationships, some of us look around at our lives and we're not satisfied with the relationships that we have. We find ourselves sometimes experiencing a little bit of loneliness and wishing that we had more people to do life with. We can find ourselves saying, I, I wish that I had better friends. Like, why is it that I don't feel like I have deep friendships? Or why is it that everyone wants to, everyone wants to hang out with that one person and it feels like 
no one wants to hang out with me? Is there something that's wrong with me? Or we can look at the number of, of friends that we have on Facebook or on Instagram and say, you know, I've got 500 friends on Facebook, but how come if I want to go see a movie with someone on a Friday night, I don't feel like I have anybody I could call? It's an interesting place that we find ourselves. And today I want to remind us as a church that bold relationships take work. To make a new friend is relatively easy, but to keep one takes commitment, and there is some assembly that is required here. And real, life-giving relationships require a two-way commitment. It's an obligation to another person in a meaningful way. It's a devotion of, of trust and time and energy and thought equity to the needs of another. And the word commitment can scare a lot of us today. But the reward of this boldness is actually a rich relationship that can last not only in the best seasons of life, but also through the hardest. And for a lot of us, pursuing new friendships and maintaining the ones that we already have can feel really challenging. When we look at our calendars, things feel a little bit hurried, don't they? We've got volunteer commitments, we've got play dates, we've got the extra curriculars, we've got the time with people after work, we've got going to the gym, time driving kids to practices, the list goes on and on. And so the thought of adding another thing to these already so full calendars seems a little bit overwhelming to us. But I want to just candidly suggest to us today that if our calendar does not include time to develop life-giving relationships, that something is broken. We all have a life in this place, and everyone in this room makes up a number of, of careers and educational endeavors and even roles as parents. And all of these things are great. But at our core, we are all still wired for human connection. And a lifestyle of isolation leads to destruction. In James 3, verse 18, we read that the only way for our community to live right with God and receive the benefit that a life-giving relationship can bring is to put in the hard work. And so in this reality of overflowing calendars and really disengaged interactions that we're having with our friends over social media, how do we actually start to cultivate these bold, bold relationships that go deeper? How do we intentionally build time with our community into the rhythms of our life and begin to understand that if we go to get coffee with a friend on an afternoon, the whole world will still carry on. I promise you that it will. We have to look to the example of Jesus for this. And to be a disciple of Jesus is to be a student of him. To look at the way that he lived his life and to model our own lives after this example. And we can see that relationship is pre-programmed into the God that we serve. At Slate Church, we believe in something called the Trinity. And so we've got God the Father, God the Son, who is Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit. And these three entities or, or persons represent the one God that we ultimately serve, but they function together in perfect relationship and unity. And when Jesus was sent to earth as God in the flesh and grew his earthly ministry, he was constantly surrounded by people. We see that hundreds, even thousands of people would flock to him everywhere he went. But out of these crowds that he was constantly surrounded by, he chose 12 men as his disciples to actually carry his mission forward. And from that group, he had another inner circle of the three, Peter, James, and John, to lean on in crucial times. And throughout the Gospels, we know that Jesus also had close ties with other people as well. He was friends with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, who threw Jesus a party before he died. John of Arimathea, who stood with Jesus' mother beside the cross. Joseph, who took his broken body down. And Mary Magdalene, who buried the body of Jesus the day after his death. These really intimate relationships that Jesus actually had with people. And when we read and hear about these relationships, it can be really challenging for us to think of Jesus as a real person. When we think of Jesus, we see him as divine and all-powerful and our Lord, and all of these things are true. But we can't remove from this the humanity that he experienced in his time on earth as well, that same humanity that we are experiencing today. And this means that Jesus did have to navigate the difficulty of relationships that you and I are navigating today as well. We know that Jesus was subject to the same ordinary human condition that we were. He would wake up in the morning, he would follow through on his commitments, whether that meant working or studying, rest or spending time with people. 
and then he would go to sleep at night and he would repeat the process. And it seems a lot like what you and I are doing every single day as well. And so there were times that Jesus would have been tired. There were times that he would have been tempted. And there were certainly times that we know that he felt betrayed. But there were also times where Jesus experienced joy. Times where he would have laughed together with friends over a great meal. Moments where he experienced deep love for the people in his life. And Jesus was on earth to reveal the love of God to us. But as an individual, he still experienced a one-on-one individual love with the people that he was surrounded by, with his community. And so for us today, if we know that Jesus needed community in his time on earth, what makes us think that sometimes we could actually get away without it? Jesus was first a friend to his disciples and then a friend to us. And before he went up to sit on the throne beside God, he gave us a direction in the way that we are to relate to one another. In John 13, verse 34 to 35, it says, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Love one another as I have loved you. It's not a metaphor for anything else. It's quite simply exactly what it says. Love one another as I have loved you. So this means we're actually called to to look at Jesus' example and to model it. And there are a number of verses in Scripture that outlines what this means for our relationships as followers of Jesus. And I want to share some of them quickly with you now. It means that we're to model forgiveness to one another. We are to regard others as more highly than ourselves. We are to teach and correct one another. We are to encourage one another. We are to pray for one another. We are to bear one another's burdens. We are to be devoted to one another. And we are to be kind and compassionate. That's a really high standard for us to live up to. And that's also not an exhaustive list. But as a church, because the Holy Spirit is in us and because the Holy Spirit goes before us, we can actually bring a little bit of heaven down to earth with the way that we love one another at Slate Church. And today I want to take the rest of the time that we have together just to share three quick things that we can do to really start assembling some fantastic relationships with the people that God has placed in our lives. And the first thing that we need to do to establish bold relationships is this. We need to check our circles. Life without the right group of friends can be really hard. It can be really challenging. Whether you're moving to a new place or you're starting at a new job or, or moving to a, a new city or going to a new church even, all of these things can feel a little bit isolating for somebody that doesn't just know right off the bat who their people are and who they can actually go to. And for me, I'm somebody that grew up in the same place for most of my life. I was in the same house for many years, and so the people that I would spend my time with were the people that I spent my time with since I was in junior kindergarten. We would knock on each other's doors, and we would say, hey, do you want to go to the park together? It was people that I would bring into to church with me as well. We really did everything together, and we, we crossed the stage at our grade 8 graduation, and it was the same friends that I had had my entire life. But a time came after we crossed that stage at grade 8 grad where we needed to decide where we were going to high school. And all of the friends that I had grown up with went to one high school together. They stuck together. They were really close. They went to the same spot. But our family moved. And so we were a little bit further away from those same friends. And this meant that I was going to be going to a new high school from the group of friends that I had grown up with. And so we, we moved to this new neighborhood, and, and the, the year of grade nine starts, and I walk in through the doors of my first day at just 14 years old, and I remember it just being such an isolating experience for me. Having grown up having the same friends for so long, the same people that I could lean on, to now be full of, or filled in a, a school with hallways and hallways of people that I don't actually know. And I remember at 14 years old, every day of that first week of high school, the bell would ring for the lunch hour, and instead of taking my food to the cafeteria to eat, I would actually take it to the bathroom. And I would eat my lunch in a stall, because I was so embarrassed of what it would actually look like if I took that food to the cafe and had other people see me sitting by myself. I actually thought this was a better solution. And so eventually I I did break out of my shell a little bit and I met some people that I could spend my time with and I, I found people that I could be around. 
But four years later, I was back in that same scenario of moving to another new city, of starting at another new school, and just thinking, I don't want to go through that same experience again. I don't want to be in a situation where I don't have good friends that I can lean on and actually have in my life. And so this time, I actually prayed about it. I actually brought it to God. And I said, God, I know that you desire good relationships for my life. I know that deep friendships that point me back to you is something that you desire for me. And so as I step into this new school, would you change the narrative? Would you actually give me a boldness and a courage to go up to the right people, to say, hey, I want to spend time with you. Let's be friends. And actually just taking the steps that were necessary to develop bold relationships in my life. And you know what happened? God answered my prayer. Because a couple of weeks later, I started in a Christian studies class. And across the room from me was a group of girls that invited me into their conversation. And those girls became the roommates that I lived with throughout the rest of university. They became the friends that stood in my wedding and I in theirs. And to this day, we're still intentional with one another. We still follow up with one another because we recognize that God has given us this gift of friendship. And we need to steward it well. And as people, we need to be so deliberate about the people that we spend our time with. Our friends rub off on us. It's really what happens. And so over time, the the likes and the dislikes and the priorities and the preferences of other people that we spend our time with begin to mirror our own. And if we've got great friends, this is a fantastic thing. It can actually be healthy for you over time, and iron can sharpen iron. But if we're not around the right people, This process of mirroring that takes place can actually lead us to dark places. And we know that bad company corrupts good character. In scripture, we see that before Jesus chose his disciples, he actually spent a night in prayer first. Luke 6, 12 to 16 says that Jesus went to a mountainside to pray and spent the night there in the presence of God. And it wasn't until the next morning, out of this place of overflowing and being in his presence, that he went out to call his disciples. And this process of selecting his people was a momentous occasion for Jesus. He knew the importance of these relationships. And so instead of worrying about it and wondering if he was going to have the right people around, he spent time seeking out the Father for the wisdom that he needed. And this allowed Jesus to be extremely deliberate about the people he had in his circle. He knew who was meant to go with him and who wasn't. And we see that there were people that Jesus actually declined having in his circle. In Luke 9, a man approaches Jesus and tells him he'll go wherever he goes. But the man didn't understand the cost of following Jesus, and so he wasn't fit to come along. And he wasn't a part of this circle that Jesus had. And for us, this can seem really hardcore. It's like, really? Jesus would actually be like, no, I don't want you to to be around me in this context. But the people that we spend our time with are the people that shape us. And Proverbs 13, 20 says, walk with the wise to become wise, for a companion of fools suffers harm. And so Jesus was deliberate about who he had in his circle. He knew he wasn't on earth just to have a good time and to do whatever he wanted, but he was actually on mission. He was placed on earth to restore joy, to heal the sick, to bind the brokenhearted, and to ultimately save our world. And church, we're also on a mission in this life. So are the people that are in your circle empowering you on the unique mission that God has for you, or are they holding you back? Yes, Jesus befriended sinners. And yes, he spent time with the people that the world deemed unworthy. But he never enabled these people or remained in their sin with them. He actually always called them up to a higher standard. And these are also not the people we know that Jesus turned to in his darkest days. He brought his trusted inner circle into those situations. And so we can't settle for what's easy when it comes to our relationships. It's really not like a path of least resistance kind of thing for us. We've got to work to get the right people in our circles. And one of the ways that you can do this, being at Slate Church, is by joining a connect group. We actually make it really simple for you and have this incredible structure where you can come into an environment of people bi-weekly for one hour and build and develop relationships in your life that are actually going to be life-giving. It's going to be people that you can celebrate with on the best days of life. It's going to be people that you can lean on on the hardest days of your life. And it's a fantastic way to know that you've got people in your corner through thick and thin. And you're invited into this. 
It's not an exclusive, an exclusive thing. It's a strictly inclusive thing that we have here at Slate Church. And if you're in a connect group right now and it doesn't feel like the right fit, that's okay. But don't give up. Try another connect group. Try going back again and building a little bit deeper with people because it's not worth not having the right people in your circle. I just encourage you today to consider jumping into a connect group. It's as simple as filling out a connect card after this service and saying, yeah, I'm, I'm ready for this. I want to jump into these relationships. We got to check our circles. And the second thing that we need to do as we work towards bold relationships is this. We need to love like we've never been hurt. Relationships are really risky, and that's because they are made up of people. They're made up of me. They're made up of you. They're made up of, of all of these people that have both good and bad elements to them. All of us have good and bad in us. We're a package deal when it comes to what we bring into relationships. And that means that in our lives, there's going to be times where we are going to get hurt. There's going to be times where things that will be said or done that will upset or offend us. But it also means that sometimes we're going to say or do things that will upset or offend other people. This is just the reality of what relationships look like. And the only antidote for all of these things, the only remedy for all of these things, is to continue to love like we've never been hurt. We need to continue to assume the best in one another. We need to stop thinking about what we wish we could change in that one person and actually just focus on the one thing that we can change, which is ourselves. Ephesians 4, verse 2 to 3 says, Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And there are people in the room today, I know, have that have been hurt before. Maybe it was a friend that you've been friends with for years that actually out of nowhere maybe turned their back on you and said some things that you weren't expecting them to say. Maybe it's a spouse that on your wedding day vowed some things to you that they're not actually really carrying forward in your relationship today. Maybe it's a family member that you really needed and they actually turned their back on you when you needed them to be there for you. There's lots of different situations represented in this room today of people that have been hurt. But in all of these situations, I think God is reminding us that we need to continue to love like we've never been hurt. You may be thinking, that's too much. If only you knew what that one person said to me. It wouldn't count. It was just such a terrible thing that they said. Or, that's too much. If only you could see what I went through or the, the things that that person did to me when I needed them to be there. I just couldn't possibly forgive. I couldn't possibly love them still. But, you know, I'm so grateful that God doesn't love us from a place of hurt. I'm so glad that although we fall short of the glory of God every single day, that he still looks at us and sees Jesus. And I'm so grateful that when we were estranged from God, he took the first step and every step necessary to actually reconcile us back into relationship with him. And as Christians, we are now carrying this same love. We are now called into a ministry of reconciliation. And as much as you've been hurt, you need to know that the person that hurt you is not your enemy. We have a very real enemy, and it's a, an enemy that seeks to steal and kill and destroy. But it's not your spouse. It's not your neighbor. It's not the friend that turned their back on you. It's not that family member. It's the devil. We have a real enemy. And this is why as Christians, every single day, we need to take steps forward towards forgiveness and love and reconciliation with the people around us. And don't get me wrong, this doesn't mean sticking with toxic people in your life. A couple of weeks ago, I heard a really interesting thing that I thought was the perfect example of this. And apparently at Disney World, they'll actually uproot and replant the trees in the park every 10 years. It sounds crazy, but there's a reason why they do it. And it's because if the trees stay in one place for too long, the trunks can actually grow a little bit too wide. And the roots of those trees can actually go a little bit too deep to the point where they're interfering with the growth of the trees that are around them. And I think sometimes as people, it's actually helpful for us to uproot ourselves sometimes and get a little bit of distance from people in our lives that might actually hold us back from growing in our relationship with God. Because it's this distance between us that will allow each of us to flourish a little bit better, to not have that same toxicity in our lives. 
But in all of this, we need to remember that even when we do uproot ourselves, it still doesn't mean that that person is our enemy. We still need to see these people as objects of God's affection, as made in the image of God. We need to continue to love the unlovable, reach the unreachable, and keep loving because love doesn't fail. We need to love like we've never been hurt. And the last thing that we need to do today is this. We need to be the friends that we all wish we had. I think it makes sense to us really rationally that relationships are good for us. We read in the Bible that community is something that God has designed for our lives. We have heard the studies about how great friendships can actually lower our blood pressure and reduce our likelihood to experience anxiety and depression and all of these different types of things. And so we understand that relationships are a good thing for us. But all of these things are still really us-focused, aren't they? How is my life? How am I doing? How are my friendships working for and serving me? But throughout the New Testament, we see a lot less of this I language and more of an other's language. It says, love one another, forgive one another, encourage one another, teach one another, serve one another, consider each other more highly than yourselves. And instead of asking whether our relationships are working for our life, I think we need to start asking if our lives are working for the people around us. If our lives are too busy to fit the right conversations in. If our schedules are too full to love our family members well. Or if we're spending so much time on our phones doing the things that we need to get done to be able to see the people that are directly in front of us, something is broken. Our lives aren't working if they're only serving ourselves. And so we need to structure them in a way that allows us to be others focused, to be the friend that we all wish we had. Matthew 20 verse 28 says that Jesus did not come to be served, but to serve. He did not come to have friends on this earth, but to be a friend. And we learn from Jesus that the essence of true friendship and true relationship is not the desire to have friends, but to actually be a really good one. Not to simply enjoy the help that friends can give you or to enjoy the opportunity that you have to call someone up when you want to go out and do something, but to reciprocate blessing to the people God has placed in our lives. Jesus wasn't just there for his friends when things were going well. He was there in every single season. He was patient, he was tender, he was unselfish. And no matter how many times his friends failed him, he loved them still. He was patient with their weakness and their slow growth as individuals, the things that can sometimes drive us crazy about the people we're in relationship with. And he never made things easier on his friends, even in situations where we think maybe he could have. He didn't spare his friends from challenging things or or difficult situations, but he encouraged them to walk through it. And he was present with them in that thing because he knew that that was best for who they were going to become. And so instead of sparing our friends from hard times, because that's not what it's about, we can't protect our friends or the people we're in relationship from the world, but we can walk with them through it. If we call upon God, he will strengthen and sustain us. And our relationships are meant to serve the same purpose. There's a quote on Jesus in the way that he did relationships with other people. And it's so beautiful. And I want to share it with you this morning. It comes from a Christian author named James R. Miller. And he puts it this way. If Jesus were a friend only for bright hours, there would be much experience into which he could not enter. But the gospel breathes comfort on every page. And Jesus is a friend for lonely hours in times of grief and pain, as well as for sunny paths and days of gladness and song. He went to a marriage feast and brought his first miracle to prolong the festivity. But he also went to the home of grief and turned its sorrow into joy. We can pass through a sore trial if a trusted friend is beside us. You know, for those who consider themselves Christian in the room today, the way that we love other people and love people, even in this community, will actually shape the perception that people have of the God that we serve. And that's a really heavy mantle to carry. But because the Holy Spirit is in us and because the Holy Spirit goes before us, we can actually do a great job at this when we lean into him. And so this year, let's love 
boldly. Let's actually call upon God to give us the strength that we need to do relationships well. Let's get the right people around us. If you're not in a connect group, why not? Get into a connect group. Let's love like we've never been hurt. And let's all be the friend that we wish that we had. Why don't we stand together today? Thank you for watching. Again, if you were impacted by this message in any way, send an email to mystory@slatechurch.com. You can also visit slatechurch.com and fill out one of our online connect cards. We would love to see you in person at one of our Sunday services. As well, you can stay connected with us by following us at Slate Church on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.